Hello, I'm Peter Denning, your host of the Harnessing AI course. We've been talking about a lot of things as we went through this course so, so far. We've had many speakers already. And along the way, we've been hearing bits and pieces about what is the Defense Department, and what is the Department of the Navy doing in this area of artificial intelligence. There's been a lot of policy statements about the importance of artificial intelligence, and there's also been organizations set up to help facilitate artificial intelligence uh, injection into the Navy and the Defense Department. So we've asked Professor Brett Michael to talk to you today about this. He's uh, been deeply involved in many AO, uh, DOD AI activities, and he's going to give you a summary of all the different kind of things that DOD is up to in this area, so you can see what's going on there. This is all public information. He's just pulling it together for you. Okay, so please welcome Brett Michael. Thank you, Peter. Okay. Well, good afternoon. It's um, wonderful to be here to um, present to you today. Uh, today I'm going to uh, talk a little bit about AI in the DOD. There is so much happening, I can't cover everything in a half an hour. Um, but during our uh, question and answer uh, period, discussion period, um, you're welcome to ask me about whatever's on your mind uh, regarding um, AI in the DOD, applications, uh, development, um, whatever it might be. So I'll start off um, just by saying, the, give the usual disclaimer. Some of the things I say here are my own opinion. Some of the things are actual uh, DOD uh, sanctions, uh, but uh, just to protect me and the school, um, uh, I have the disclaimer here that I'm expressing my own views um, on many of these subjects. Uh, one of the uh, challenges that we have in DOD is it's an extremely large organization. There are 16 departments. There are multiple defense um, intelligence agencies. Uh, there are um, many different um, what I would call sub-organizations within the larger enterprise, and they all have um, slightly different missions. Of course, they all have the, the overall um, enterprise mission to accomplish, but they each have, uh, each organization has specific missions. Um, one of the um, sponsors of some of my research is the Defense Threat Reduction Agency, and they have specific um, requirements, um, and they have specific guidance uh, from um, the DOD enterprise um, to address certain types of problems. That's just one example where, you know, uh, DFAS, which handles finance and accounting for the D DOD, they have um, a, a different mission um, that supports the greater mission of the enterprise. So you have a lot of heterogeneity, and so there is no one um, one-size-fits-all uh, description of what AI in the DOD is. It's something different for each organization. However, what we need as an enterprise is a uh, common set of principles. Uh, we need an educated workforce that understands how to apply AI um, so that we can tailor that technology to address um, actual problems that we need to solve. So, I just want to put this in context for you. Um, now, at the bigger picture level, um, we know that there's competition amongst the great powers and even the lesser powers. It's not, uh, AI is not just being adopted by the United States, Russia, and China. It's being adopted um, throughout the world and um, even by uh, organizations which, to which um, the U.S. Uh, and specifically the Department of Defense belong, such as NATO, uh, the North Atlantic Treaty Organization. So there's a lot going on. Um, however, this is a very telling quote. I think maybe one of the other speakers may have mentioned this, but um, I, I just want to reinforce this. Uh, President Putin um, stated that artificial intelligence is the future not only for Russia, but for all humankind. It comes with colossal opportunities but also threats that are difficult to predict. 
whenever, whoever becomes the leader in this sphere will become the ruler of the world. Now, as many of you studied, if you had to take uh, introductory philosophy as one of your core courses as an undergraduate, you know about uh, fallacious arguments and you know, appeals to things like the bandwagon and appeal to fear. This is sort of an appeal to fear. It's saying, you know, unless you get on the ball and you're the first, uh, first to market um, in, in IT terms to uh, be able to um, actually operationalize AI, um, you're not going to get much market share. And in, in terms of national security, your country is going to be at risk. So. That's essentially what he's saying here. Um, so it, it, it has this kind of like feel of um, dominance, you know, world dominance and all that stuff. But, but don't be um, too excited here uh, because it's one thing to have um, new technologies and actually AI's been around a long time. We've been studying AI since the 1940s. It really took off in the 50s and now it's really become um, something that we can leverage because we have the computing resources that make um, the autom types of automation that we refer to within the rubric of AI possible. But um, th the key here is that um, investment is taking place and it's accelerating. Um, the, the US Department of Defense has, has come out with many statements about you know, how much they're going to spend on um, AI over uh, the coming year, FY22, as well as into the out years, they're already planning um, large expenditures uh, to, to move the DOD forward in operationalizing AI. But we're not the only ones. Countries like China um, and uh, Russia, as well as many others, um, are really investing a lot. Uh, here it says China's 2030 plan envisions a $1 trillion artificial intelligence industry in China. So this is industry, not just their military, but they, in China, the People's Republic of China, there's a merging of the civilian infrastructure with the military infrastructure. Actually, they're quite t tight um, in many cases. And they, it goes on to say they want to become a cyber superpower and are investing in capital markets, universities, research centers, defense industry, and commercial software companies. If you are working on a thesis here at the Naval Postgraduate School in the area of artificial intelligence, and you go on to the Association for Computing Machinery um, online library or the IEEE um, Explorer online library, and you search for uh, papers that have been written uh, over the past 10 years on some topic in the area of artificial intelligence, which is a very broad area of, of study, includes robotics, um, cognitive psychology, all kinds of things. What you'll find is that many of the um, research papers are being published by uh, academics and members of industry, practitioners in China, and, uh, and not just China, many other countries. Uh, that's, not, that's not necessarily a bad thing. Uh, because we can leverage that knowledge that's being um, published in the open literature. But uh, what we do have to be um, uh, um, wary of is uh, falling behind and actually adopting uh, uh, artificial intelligence technology where it's needed uh, and where it can give us, a comp as a nation, a competitive advantage. Um, DOD is, uh, there's DOD driven AI innovation. I know that uh, Professor Denning has been talking a lot about that um, over the past couple years here on campus. He teaches um, courses on innovation and leads workshops on that topic. Uh, the U.S. Department of Defense um, should be, has been a leading innovator in uh, artificial intelligence for, for many decades. It's actually been one of the major investors in this uh, technology and in addition to investing in R&D has actually applied it. Um, and the interesting thing here is that there's a lot of um, corporate knowledge. Some of it doesn't seem to percolate out. It seems like if it's not on the internet, um, as, as they, some researchers said many years ago at a conference I attended, it doesn't matter. <laughs> but um, yes, it does matter because there are uh, studies of um, attempts to apply AI in the DOD 
dating back to the 1960s. And there have been quite a few interesting lessons learned. And hopefully, uh, you will avail yourself of looking at those um, past attempts and understanding what went right and what went wrong and not repeat history except where we were successful. Um, but the, there, you have to be careful, too, because the context of application um, uh, changes over time. And other, the other factors are not equal. We can't say ceteris paribus because uh, we have non-stationarity, uh, the, the uh, organizational dynamics, uh, acquisition policy and practices. Um, the state of the technology cha has changed over the years. But there are some very good lessons learned um, that, uh, that you need to uh, um, find out about to be uh, successful in your acquisition of um, AI-enabled systems. So that brings me to AI-enhanced DOD systems. And this is a, a topic that um, Dr. Denning and Dr. Doran Drazensky um, of the Computer Science Department and I have had discussions about. And we were trying to think, well, what really is an AI-enhanced DOD system? Well, we have our core components of traditional DOD systems on the left here. And uh, as you see on the right, uh, we have some major new components that makes DOD systems AI enhanced. Um, that, uh, those components are learning machines, reasoning machines, and massive data sources. And I, I'm pretty sure that someone has probably talked to you about this already, but just to remind you, um, these major new components, let's look at each one of them, learning machines. These are machines that learn about the operating environment, and recommend some preliminary actions. And we, we already have these types of systems. We have this type of automation within the United States Navy. We have it on you know, uh, Aegis-class ships. We have uh, uh, net-centric capabilities for engage on remote. We have uh, systems that advise um, the, the, the commander of the ship and his crew, as to, and his or her crew, uh, as to what actions uh, might be uh, uh, opportunistic to take. And even uh, some of these systems will even reason about the rules of engagement. And that brings us to uh, reasoning machines. Reasoning machines apply the rules of engagement and other forms of human reasoning to outputs from learning machines and make final re recommendations to the uh, command and control and, and management operators. An example of this, um, where the Navy is a part of the overall system of systems, is the ballistic missile defense system um, that's managed by the uh, Missile Defense Agency. Um, the, uh, it used to be called, and it's probably changed, the name has probably changed several times, um, the Global Integrated Fire Control System. It's highly automated. The, the GIFIC, as it's called, um, is, is sort of, think of it as the brains of the missile defense system. And it has encoded in it the rules of engagement for engaging threat missiles and what to do about things that look like threat missiles that are being tracked and actually makes recommendations um, as to what to do because you can have thousands of things that look like real threat missiles, but some of those could be decoys. I can't talk more about it than that, but AI has been applied in as part of the automation of the various aspects of tasks that are um, that take place in the what we call the uh, the kill chain for actually intercepting uh, real threat missiles and destroying them before they get to their target. We also have massive data sources, and you know, AI. There's this sort of what is AI? Well. <laughs> Everybody has their own definition, but uh, AI is heavily dependent um, on data and quality data, data that can be used and interpreted correctly. But we have these massive data uh, sources. So we have large-scale sensor networks and repositories for raw and partially processed data. You have that in the US Navy. You have that uh, in the ballistic missile defense system. Um, so we have sensor nets, sens networks of sensors. Um, that are providing um, uh, data. And we're actually seeing all kinds of new 
uh, ways of obtaining that data and where it's being processed. It's not necessarily being pushed back to a data center from downrange. We're actually pushing uh, uh, AI out to the edge, the intelligent edge. So you know we have edge servers, uh, edge nodes that even on the sensors themselves that can do a certain amount of um, processing of that data and application of things like machine learning. So we're, we're seeing the push of AI out to uh, the edge, and we're, we're going to see a lot of interesting applications. We already are seeing that, but it's just going to accelerate with uh, advance, advances in tech, um, communications technology, uh, such as uh, uh, fifth generation new radio, 5G NR, which you've heard a lot about. You hear commercials about that for use with your personal um, mobile devices, but it's actually going to be useful for uh, DOD, and there are a whole host of other sat um, satellite-based and other communications technologies that are making all this come to fruition. Uh, there are lots of DOD programs to, to counter uh, threats out there. Um, so we have many uh, different organizations within DOD that are uh, promoting the use of AI. Um, but it's, it, they're not really promoting it in a marketing sense, but they're, they're helping um, focus attention of the various organizations in DOD to um, align their investments, uh, investment strategies um, along various portfolios that address uh, critical uh, challenges that the DOD and each of the services that are, that are part of the DOD uh, face um, today. So, uh, some of the DARPA, Defense Advanced Research Projects Agency's um, uh, programs are guaranteeing AI robustness against deception. This is that what you, you know, this this refers back to what you heard earlier in this uh, this uh, seminar about adversarial uh, machine learning. So how do we guard uh, against uh, someone uh, manipulating a the behavior of a um, a machine learning system, but we can think of that in a larger context. It's not just machine learning. There's a, there are all, there's a hierarchy of machines, uh, which uh, Dr. Denning has uh, talked about uh, on many occasions. But um, if you think about it, we have like you know, um, uh, artificial neural networks and expert systems sort of at the bottom of the hierarchy, all the way up through you know, the commander data type of humanoid <laughs> Um, AI entity. Um, well, we're not talking about sentient, um, uh, be, uh, sentient artificial beings today, uh, but maybe sometime in the future we'll get there. But we have a hierarchy of learning machines, and uh, you know, machine learning is sort of at the at least the, there's uh, unsupervised and supervised learning, sort of in the middle of that hierarchy of uh, types of um, uh, learning machines that. We think of when we're talking about um, artificial intelligence. Uh, I'm sure you've all heard about Sea Hunter. Probably read about it. Some of you may have worked um, uh, on some aspect of Sea uh, Hunter, uh, whether it's doctrine, policy, or engineering uh, of Sea of Hunter, or maybe acquisition. Uh, but we have, you know, Sea Hunter, which can be used for many different types of missions. One of those being submarine hunting. Um, in an, a semi-autonomous mode, where the uh, the Sea Hunter craft, which is not manned, it's unmanned, uh, would be part of uh, would be a, assigned to, for example, a battle group, and it would be sent off to do certain tasks. And, but it, it would operate largely autonomous, autonomously. But there would be communication from um, a manned ship um, providing uh, commands or direction uh, for this autonomous ship to do to carry out certain tasks. We have uh, competency, competency aware machine learning. It's, it's known as CAMEL. Um, and this deals with uh, trustworthy autonomous systems. So there's a whole uh, range of uh, different areas of AI uh, endeavors that, that DARPA is pushing forward. And remember, DARPA uh, really focuses on investments in technology that are going to produce you know almost quantum leaps in what they 
they look at it as uh, really advancing, making major advances in the state of the art to support um, the mission of the Department of Defense. And here are the th five capability areas. Um, you've got new capabilities, um, next generation AI, so looking out ahead. Uh, high performance AI, how can, what do we need in order to support um, uh, advanced uh, machine learning and other uh, aspects of um, AI, including uh, data um, analytics, or what it's called big data or data sciences. But you know, what type of high performance computing do we need uh, to support the, the types of uh, applications we want to develop um, that have a, an AI uh, component to it? Um, robust AI, of course, is important. We want to make sure that, uh, that the, the system doesn't fail um, to performance requirements. There's a reliability issue here, but robustness in, in the sense of uh, also you know, robustness to, for example, uh, cyber attacks, uh, adversarial AI, and so on. We also have, uh, and also for scale, uh, robustness and scalability, but, you know, robustness as the amount of um, work that the system has to um, uh, accomplish in some period of time that the system doesn't fail and become oversaturated somehow. We also have adversarial AI um, listed here. And these focus areas change over time, but these are some very, um, you know, fundamental er areas that are going to be important uh, to the Department of Defense for um, uh, many years to come. We also have uh, leveraging weaponized AI. So I'm sure people have talked about this during the seminar. It's coming in at the end of the, almost the tail end of the seminar. Um, it's kind of hard to, to hit on just new things because nothing's really new but especially in a seminar after the um, many many weeks you've heard a, lo a lot about a lot of things so uh, but uh, some examples of leveraging weaponized AI are selecting and engaging military targets autonomously um, such as intelligent lethal drones doing this type of work uh, there are other applications I can't talk about um, necessarily but um, in an open forum but there's a lot of work in this area of autonomy. There's a lot of um, debate, discussion about how much autonomy. Uh, as a matter of fact, well, one of my colleagues and I have gone around and round over the past two weeks about um, autonomy because uh, I'm one of those people that have actually built autonomous um, vehicles. Uh, the systems that run autonomous vehicles actually automated cars and actually got it to work and work pretty well. But as an engine on my putting on my engineering cap, um, we uh, segregated those auto fully automated cars th that ran under full, um, uh, fully, that were fully automated uh, from vehicles being driven by humans. So we had what we called automa automated highway lanes, which are dedicated for automated driving, and you have a hand handoff control as the dual mode vehicle comes onto the automated highway and a handoff back to the from the system back to the human as they exit. And we came up with all kinds of protocols. We actually demonstrated that technology back in 1997 at the University of California, Berkeley. So it is possible. Um, but once again, you have to have an engineer, engineering view. Yes, the scientist view will say, it's just not possible. But engineers make things that people say is impossible happen. So anyway, <laughs> have to, I have to put, throw that plug in. Also, one of my heroes is Scotty on Star Trek. So, and uh, even with that project, we didn't uh, we didn't promise uh, Caltrans, um, the U.S. Department of Transportation, and others that we'd get this pro actually be able to do this demonstration by a particular date. Um, that was really really soon. We said, "Oh, it's going to take us many many years." We actually did it in uh, a very few number of years, and we look like heroes. So. <laughs> Just remember that from Star Trek, too. Um, also, we have automating and optimizing, um, as the Russians call it, Maskarovka. I'm sure I, mis I didn't pronounce that quite right, but uh, the idea here is that um, we've seen uh, asymmetric political warfare um, in the form of things like influence campaigns um, blossom. 
And many, much of that is actually based upon automation, and some of it is based upon artificial intelligence, trying to create deceptions and influence people as well. There are many uh, strategies. I won't spend a lot of time on this because I'm sure this was covered as well, but there are uh, many uh, documents back in 2019 and uh, 2018. We had the summary of the uh, Department of Defense Artificial Intelligence Strategy, and we also had the uh, AI, the National AI Research and Development Strategic Plan um, updated. And since then, we've seen updates to these uh, strategies and plans uh, every year. It's, it's annual, and it's become a very major um, uh, focus area of the Department of Defense, as well as um, the entire um, uh, executive branch of the uh, U.S. government. Um, so it's, it's, it's uh, across uh, federal agencies. DOD is not alone in trying to uh, plow forward in, in applying AI. Um, this is the chiclet, you know, the little pieces of candy that, you know, come in different colors. But you can see that we have uh, the, the, at the national level, uh, we've looked at cross-cutting R&D foundations where you have uh, ethical, legal, societal implications, safety and security, and all, everything else, even standards and benchmarks, um, at, sort of at the foundation. Then you have the R&D part. You know, what are the different areas that we're going to make investments in, uh, such as scalable AI, uh, general AI, data analytics, perception, and so on. And then we have, at the top, the application areas that we map to. So it's basically a, a, three, a three, three tiers with a mapping between uh, the foundation to the R&D and then a mapping from R&D to applications. Uh, national and DOD AI str strategies. Well, um, Mr. Dana Deasy, who was the, f who's, was the former uh, DOD CIO, um, stated that the DOD AI strategy uh, directly supports every aspect of the national defense strategy. As I uh, started out my talk saying just that. Uh, and the defense innovation, uh, so we have that strategy and we have um, uh, many other uh, policy documents that are helping direct our attention at how to, to make wise investments and um, make the DOD uh, very competitive and uh, relative to um, other military forces around the world. Um, but we have, uh, we need help, and uh, there's this, the D Defense Innovation Unit um, was created by DOD to make a closer bond between industry and um, uh, uh, the, the DOD um, uh, organizations, so it engages across DOD and AI and makes it commercial, uh, its commercial knowledge and relationships with potential vendors available to any of the services, service labs, and components, it's, which is a, you know, really important because a lot is happening in industry. Uh, DOD used to do a lot of um, R&D internally, and it was very DOD specific, but now DOD is a customer of um, what's being developed within industry for a whole host of other problem sets out there that have nothing to do necessarily directly with defense, but there is a, um, the, the, think of it as the, a lot of the expertise lies in industry where AI is moving uh, fast and uh, very fast forward. Um, so uh, we also have the Defense Innovation Board who is um, trying to facilitate um, uh, uh, applications of AI um, and understanding um, problems that the Department of Defense needs to, or I should say challenges, that the Department of Defense uh, needs to ad uh, address in the near term as well as uh, over uh, the long term. So uh, the, the DIB, as it's uh, commonly known, uh, is conducting multiple um, long term studies um, and pr uh, providing periodic publications of their interim um, results of those studies to advise uh, leadership within the Department of Defense as to 
what we need to do. And here's one, uh, for example, on AI principles, recommendations on the ethical use of artificial intelligence by uh, the Department of Defense. Uh, we also have another facilitator that was stood up by the um, Secretary of, the F of Defense. Uh, that is the Joint Artificial Intelligence Center, also known as the Jake. So the Jake has not been around for very long, but the Jake is not a, um, they don't actually develop things internally uh, for uh, various organizations within DOD. What the Jake does is it provides uh, infrastructure, tools, um, frameworks, um, and hooks up uh, various entities within DOD and with also with uh, outs, um, the defense industrial um, sector and others to uh, be able to operationalize AI. So the Jake is a facilitator. A lot of what they're doing is um, focused on acquisition reform to, to support uh, this oper operationalization of AI by DOD. It's also um, here at MPS, we are involved in the Jake's uh, educational efforts, education and training. Uh, we're, we're part of the uh, Create AI and uh, Drive AI uh, pilot programs where we're um, putting together learning resources for um, the DOD enterprise. Uh, you have the Office of Naval Research. Um, so since we're Navy, thought I'd mention them. They're a big player and they're covering everything from reasoning all the way down to knowledge representation and, um, um, and management, uh, looking at um, um, man, uh, human machine interaction, um, all these very important things uh, that we need to advance in the technical sphere in order to be able to uh, solve DOD problems. Uh, private sector enabling arms race, well, Companies are, as like I said, are the major driver behind advances in AI. Um, AI technology is developed for commercial use, that's developed for commercial use is being repurposed for military uh, use. This has you know, been a long-standing um, thing that's happened. You know, things that DARPA develops, or has developed by it, the performers on various projects, actually have been applied in agriculture and, uh, um, commerce and you know many different areas but the same applies here you know, NASA has always prided itself on doing research that can doesn't only just support space programs but supports um, uh, material science uh, medicine and you name it but the same thing is happening here and industry is assisting governments um, uh, leverage AI however um, it varies from one part of the world to another. In the, in the U.S., uh, we have DOD, we've primarily taken an incremental um, approach to innovation in the area of AI. However, we're shifting more towards transformative innovation. China and Russia are like full bore. They're, they're looking for fast, transformative, you know, um, oper operationalization of AI and um, they're, they're developing things that we are taking a slower approach to because we, we are uh, thinking about things like, you know, eth the ethics of whatever is being developed, the legality, and uh, the supportability, sustainment of uh, various applications. Um, uh, there's a lot of commonality in the terms of collaboration with industry as well as academia. However, in Russia and China, um, uh, actors outside of um, their military establishments are directed, it's pretty heavy handed, um, to participate with industry, whereas the, in the United States, we, have, we live by you know, our laws and democracy, and we encourage uh, industry to cooperate with us, but they don't have to. So there's not a heavy hand there. 
Of course, we try to entice them um, with money, but as you can see here, we have uh, some, in some cases, cooperation, in some cases, not co no, lack of cooperation. So, um, two examples, not that long ago, uh, Google, it says here, will not renew Pentagon contract that upsets employees. So, you know, there are people that have a cultural dis predisposition to um, doing things that they view as um, being militaristic or militarization of some technology. We also have here, Microsoft says it will sell Pentagon artificial intelligence and other advanced technology. So there's a really, you know, and it, it, it seesaws and it doesn't mean that Google isn't working with the federal government and with the DOD to do things, but you know, they're, they, they have, uh, companies uh, have a lot of pressure on them from a, a multitude of stakeholders. Um, we also have an uneven playing field in the great power competition. Uh, examples include differences in abiding by international norms. So for example, willingness pr to purposely operate in gray areas of the law and cultural acceptance, willingness uh, to invest in and adopt militarized AI. Uh, taking the high road, I'm almost there at the end, but I wanted to uh, uh, leave you with um, this uh, quote from Dr. Esper, who is the former uh, uh, Secretary of Defense. He said, the United States will once again lead the way in the responsible development and application of emerging technologies, reinforcing our role as the global security partner of choice. I think we can see why, you know, we're trying to take the high road and attract others to work with us. Um, and I think that's, that's you know, a, a really nice statement there that we should all try to uh, go for uh, and, and abide by. Um, we have dilemmas impacting DOD AI use. I've talked about a few of those, but um, there's a list here. I don't have time to go into each of these. Uh, there's a nice paper that, um, Dr. Denning, Dr. Jasensky, and I uh, co-authored that appeared in U.S. Naval Institute Proceedings. I uh, encourage you to take a look at that paper. If you can't find it, um, Dr. Denning or I could, can provide that paper to you because it's behind a paywall of U.S. Uh, Naval Institute. But um, we, we can provide you with that paper. But uh, we, we looked at uh, various dilemmas impacting DOD AI use at least for uh, the types of technology that are being applied in today's systems and you know, what we need to, to work uh, towards in addressing these various dilemmas. Um, and in summary, I'd like to say adopting AI is key to transforming DOD operations and maintaining a strategic advantage across mission sets. And partnering with industry and academia, academia is essential to successful innovation by DOD and AI, and other countries have recognized this as well, and are, uh, we're all each following each other um, in that uh, uh, development of relationships with um, parties external to our enterprise. So with that, I'll open the floor to some questions if we have some time.